he must have pointed out, I'm not, not as young as I look, I've been doing science for a long time, I've been doing science for 55 years, and throughout that time I've studied the biology of memory. And uh, people who don't know me very well think that I've had a really extremely well thought out and successfully planned career, one step following very logically from the next, uh, and nothing could be further from the truth. I wandered around aimlessly for the first few years, trying to find out what the appropriate direction for my work would be, and only by accident did I find it. Uh, and much of my life, my impetus has come from my initial experience in India. Uh, as you heard from the ambassador, I, I'm Jewish and I was born in Vienna in November 1929. In March 1938, Hitler came into Vienna, came into Austria, and he changed my life forever. Because as you probably know, he was welcomed with open arms by the Austrians. Um, and it was an amazing experience. Uh, Zuckmaier, the German uh, dramatist, uh, who had written the Teufels General, uh, was in Vienna. He had, his, he had left Germany because he knew he would have difficulty with Hitler in 1933. He settled in Austria, and he was in Vienna at the time of the Anschluss. And he said, I lived through the First World War. I fought at the front. I saw people gas right next to me. I saw comrades killed next to me. I was in Munich in the Putsch in 1923, I was at the takeover in Berlin in 1933. Nothing is comparable to the horror that I saw in Vienna. The beating up of Jews, the brutality that was released at that particular point. And all of us experienced it. It was really just a question of how soon do we get out? And we were fortunate, my parents and I, my brother and I, the first, uh, my parents left thereafter. But that impression of the transformation of a people from listening to Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven one day and beating up the Jews the next was to me incomprehensible. And I've tried really throughout my early career to try to understand that. And I, when I went to Harvard, I focused in on intellectual history in Europe. And I wrote my dissertation on Zuckmaier, Carossa, and Jünger people who had three different positions on the political spectrum, their attitude, their response to National Socialism. And as I was doing this, I fell in love. You know, this happens to people. Uh, and I fell in love with a Viennese woman who was the daughter of a psychoanalyst. Ernst Chris, he was in the Freud circle. Mariana Chris was a very good friend of Anna Freud's. And we became extremely good friends. Um, and he said to me, if you want to understand motivation, if you want to understand how people work, intellectual history is not the way to do this. You've got to go into psychoanalysis. You've got to understand the mind. So I began to read Freud, and I really got quite inspired about the possibility. This was 1950s, when psychoanalysis was in America, really an exciting direction. And so at the spur of the moment, having finished three years without any scientific background, I took my first science course in the summer school at Harvard, and in the fall, I was admitted to medical school. And I went to medical school with one idea in mind, I would become a psychologist. But in my senior year, I had six months without anything to do. So I decided that even a Fifth Avenue psychoanalyst should know something about the brain. In those days, brain science was a very small discipline. And there was no one in my medical school that had you teaching it. So I went to Columbia and I worked with a guy called Harry Bernfest. And to my amazement, I immensely enjoyed it. I hadn't liked my science courses too much. I thought they were boring reading these textbooks. It really wasn't meaningful in terms of my life experience. But doing experiments, thinking about what you would do the next day, gossiping about other colleagues, the sensual pleasure of actually dissecting and preparation was absolutely wonderful. And I remember after several months of this, this was six months elected, I went to dinner with the woman who later would become uh, my wife, Denise. I had broken up with, with Anna Chris earlier. And I said to her, you know, this would be a wonderful way to spend my career, but it's preposterous. 
you don't have any money, and I don't have any money, I mean, I have to go into private practice. And she said, absurd, absolutely ridiculous. Money is of no significance. I should tell you, she has never, she's never uttered those magic words again. <laughs> But anyway, because of that, because of that experience, Grimfest recommended me to the National Institute of Health, which are good now, but in those days were the highest of the high, because there were very few places doing brain science. This was the one place that had really a very good set of laboratories on it. And when I got out of medical school in 1956, I actually started the NIH after year of internship, 1957, physicians were being drafted in the aftermath of the Korean War. And if you were eligible for the NIH, and this was less than 1%, you could use that as service time. So I went there, and I spent three years at the NIH, and even though I went on to become a psychiatrist, this has been my career ever since. It's really changed my life. When I got there, uh, Wade Marshall, my boss, who was a very sort of laissez-faire guy, said to me, um, what would you like to work on? I didn't have a far too notion of what I wanted to work on. Um, I thought about it and I thought, you know, memory is the central problem of psychiatry, the central problem of psychoanalysis. We are who we are, what we learn and remember, and psychoanalysis is an attempt to bring back painful experiences in a protected environment and to live them through all over again. In 1957, when I began to think about working on memory, uh, Brenda Milner, the very famous psychologist at Montreal, had just studied this famous patient, H.M., and had found that an important class of memories involves the hippocampus. And what she described as the memory storage in the hippocampus was what we call explicit memory storage, complex memories about people, places, and objects. So when you think of the bad things in your life or the good things, you make a conscious effort to recall. She also discovered that there were simple memories, reflex acts that you can modify, you can make them stronger, more effective, you can weaken them. These implicit behaviors were mediated by the structures. Being young and very ambitious, I thought I would tackle the most difficult problem in the world. Complicated memories go directly studied in the campus. And I've learned how to put electrodes in the cells in Bernfest lab. And I've become a fairly good, although relatively inexperienced, cellular physiologist. So I thought I would apply cellular techniques to the hippocampus. No one had done this before. And within a few months, another young colleague and I succeeded in doing this. And everybody was just excited. Two incompetent young kids <laughs> who made a major discovery. We found how the cells in the hippocampus work. And they were excited, and we were excited. Everything was wonderful to me. Yes, I thought, what did we learn about memory? Not a damn thing. <laughs> in order to learn about memory, you have to see how sensory information comes into the organism and how it's modified by certain learning experiences. So we're trying to see how does sensory information come into the head, we can't just, and we realize, boy, this is complicated. <laughs> and after a while, I said to myself, you know, we're going about this in the wrong way. You know, before you can walk, you should crawl. Rather than taking the most complicated form of memory, the most complicated structure, why don't I take a very simple form of memory in a very, very simple animal? And I began to look around for different form, types of animals that might be suitable for study learning, and I focused in on a marine snail called the plisia, because it had gigantic nerve cells. It has the largest nerve cells in the animal kingdom. It also has few cells, and the cells are absolutely distinctive. So you can recognize the same cell in every animal of the species, and you can give them names. Harry, John, and Mary. <laughs> you know, we are less, imagine, uh, less imaginative than that, so we call them R1 and L1, depending on which side of the ganglia they sat on. So I, in this simple animal with a simple nervous system, I worked out a simple behavior, a simple reflex withdrawal, and I explored to see how it can be modified by learning. And I found it can be modified by four different kinds of learning. Habituation, sensitization, plasma conditioning, and operant conditioning. And each of those forms had a short-term memory and long-term memory, depending on repetition. So what's habituation? If I were to bang on the table, you would stop. Right? And if I were to continue to bang on the table, you'd say, who is this nut? I would go back and give them my Karina Bentley's uh, so you would ignore this, and that's habituation. 
when an innocuous stimulus is repeated, you learn to ignore it. This is not terribly important in Mönchkirchen, but in Vienna and in New York, it's absolutely essential. <laughs> So, sensitization is the opposite. If you scare the hell out of the animal, if you shock its tail, you startle it so it's afraid, you now elicit the reflex and it's much more powerful than it was before. So with these ideas in mind, I began to work out the neural circuit of the reflex. It was quite simple. I could see there were sensory nerves that picked up one part of the skin, motor nerves that picked and moved. The, so this was a withdrawal response, like the withdrawal of a hand from a hot object. So there were sensory neurons that carry the information and motor neurons that cause the movement. And then I looked what happens during different forms of learning. And I found that the critical change was not in the nerve cell, but in the connections between nerve cells, what neurobiologists is called the synapse. We found that in fact the synapse is extremely plastic. Your synapses can be modified very easily by experience. <clears throat> With habituation, the connection between neurons, the sensory and the motor nerve, became weaker. And if you gave two or three training trials, the weakness persisted for a short period of time. But if you give repeated training trials, the memory, ignoring the stimulus, persisted for weeks, and the synapse was essentially inactivated for a period of weeks. If you scared the hell out of the animal with sensitization, you strengthened the synapse. And if you did that repeatedly, the synapse would be strengthened for a period of weeks. We then looked to see what was responsible for that. We found amazingly <laughs> that if you look at habituation, as the synapse gets weaker, the number of connections, the anatomical connections between nerve cells decreases. It goes from 1,200 to 800. If you sensitize, you double the number of synaptic connections. You go from 1,200 to 2,800. So if you remember anything about what I'm saying to you tonight, and I urge you not to remember anything, <laughs> it is because there will be an anatomical change in your brain. You will be a different person as a result of being here at the Austrian Cultural Forum, which I didn't have to tell you. You knew this before, if you've ever visited me before. It changes your mind. We then began to explore what are the molecular underpinnings of this. We focused on sensitization. And we found that the sensitizing stimulus activates an arousal system. In a pussy, it's serotonin, but it's very much like dopamine would be in your brain. Uh, that arousal system activates a signaling system within the cell called the psychic AMP system, and that acts through an enzyme called the psychic AMP-dependent protein kinase. These details aren't important. What's interesting is that with short-term memory, when you just activate the behavior a few times, the enzyme stays in the uh, synapse of the neuron, and it doesn't move from there. But if you have repeated training, the enzyme moves into the nucleus, and it alters the expression of genes. And it's the alteration of the expression of genes that gives rise to the proteins that are responsible for the growth of new synaptic connections. Andreas is already worried, and many young people in the audience get worried when I tell them this, because first of all, they think that Genes are the controllers of behavior, and they don't realize that they're also the servants of the environment. But also, Andreas is worried about something else. And I want to assure you, you don't have to worry. You can easily go to sleep with your partner tonight. And if you have a baby, God willing, you'll have a baby. You don't have to worry. The baby will not know anything that Andreas learned here tonight. <laughs> the genes that are being changed are being changed in specific nerve cells of your brain. They're not in the sperm, they're not in the egg, they no way interfere with the pleasures of life that you have in the course of reproduction or the consequences there. 